Good day, basic statistics and probability class. I have learned that the email that I sent out last week explaining that we weren't going to have uh, online class until this week sadly does not seem to have, me uh, have made it to any of you. That'll teach me to rely on Jix to send my email. <clears throat> Uh, this will be posted on Moodle, and uh, your homework, as usual, will be on Wiley Plus. Um, so, with a minimum of cat interference, hopefully, <laughs> uh, I'm going to uh, go through the presentation that is actually from our old engineering statistics book and more or less just assume that uh, we can start over on uh, what is chapter six in your books um, and uh, the understanding of that. Uh, so that being the case uh, uh, let us begin. Okay, so this is about uh, data summary, <laughs> summary and presentation. Um, and um, th the way we uh, the way we show data is just as important as how we analyze the data. Although, of course, a lot of the analysis that we're talking about uh, you will encounter in um, uh, you will encounter in um, uh, in inferential statistics. All right, Kitty, get out of the way, man. Nobody wants to look at your butt. <clears throat> All right, so. Uh, anyway, um, uh, learning objectives, I think we've all learned about that. Our sample mean, or for that matter, our population mean, are calculated by adding up all the data points and dividing by the, the number of data points in general. So we've gone over that before. Um, they go through the same O-ring strength um, example uh, from this book as they do in the other. Um, and uh, the, our thing to take away is that our mean is kind of the balance point between all our points. Uh, the population mean, as I said before, is um, uh, calculated by taking all the data points in a population and um, uh, and then um, uh, uh, dividing them by the total number in the population. So again, it's done very similarly to the way we do uh, a sample mean and but very often we have the problem that a uh, uh, that a population mean is just not possible to calculate. I use the example in class of what is the average weight of uh, of uh, all Americans. Well, <clears throat> since there are over 330 million Americans, assuming that the COVID uh, doesn't take out a lot of them, um, we are not really going to be able to um, uh, calculate that uh, because we're not going to be able to go to every American and say, all right, how much do you weigh? And have them give us an accurate number. 
uh, and then add all those up and divide by the total number of Americans. Uh, it is just too big a task. All right, so our sample variance and our sample standard deviation, again, our sample variance is the summation from i equals 1 to n of our data points minus our sample mean. That quantity is squared uh, for each one and then divided by n minus 1. Our sample standard deviation is the square root of the sample variance. Um, they say positive square root, um, but if you get a negative variance, you're already in trouble. Variance has to be positive. All right, so um, they're showing you here, these are all the data points for the O-ring experiment, right? Um, this one was the one that was taken first. Uh, this is the one that was taken second, third, and so on down till we have uh, number eight. We then, uh, we then uh, uh, take all of those, we put them into a table, and um, we put those into a table where we can then, um, we have all of our sample, uh, uh, all of our sample values. Our xi minus uh, our x bar comes out then to be, uh, because you remember x bar turns out to be 1055. Okay, so uh, xi uh, 1048 minus uh, 1055 is negative 7. Uh, 1059 minus 1055 is 4, and so on down the line. Uh, then we're going to take those values and we're going to square them. And of course, even when we square negative numbers, it comes out to be positive. We add those all up and it comes out to be 1348. We calculate the sample variance then sample variance by taking that 1348 dividing by n minus 1 so 1348 divided by 7 is 192.57 psi and our sample standard deviation is just the square root of that so sample standard deviation equals 13.9 PSI. Uh, we can also uh, uh, calculate our sample variance by using this formula. Um, uh, as I've said to y'all before, this is not my favorite way of doing it. Um, but uh, this is uh, totally based on what you, the individual, are able to uh, uh, to uh, uh, take in and uh, uh, and use. So if this works better for you, knock yourself out. Uh, all right, so when we talk about population variance, it's a slightly different way of calculating than sample variance. 
our population variance sigma squared is equal to the summation from i equals 1 to n of our quantities xi minus mu squared divided by n. Again, our sample variance is a good estimate of population variance. Um, all right, so the stem and leaf diagram, we've gone through this before. Um, we are going to take the numbers in our... Uh, 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 heavy cats, they've been eating too much. Uh, we're going to take the number and we're going to divide into two parts. So there will be a stem side and then there will be leaf side. So we put them in a vertical column. We record the leaves for each observation beside the, the stem. And we write the uh, units for the stems and leaves on the display. All right, so they are going to take um, the uh, same compressive strength data that we looked at in class um, and create a stem and leaf diagram uh, out of it. All right, so here is that stem and leaf, uh, or the... Uh, the, the data to use for the stem and leaf diagram. This is the same one we did in class. They get a stem and leaf diagram that looks like this, right? Again, like the one we did in class, it, we can see this looks like normal data because it looks very much like a bell curve here. Now, sometimes we want to take stem and leaf diagrams and we want to break them down further. When we look at the diagram over here, we can see, all right, it looks like it's a little bit of a hump, but we can't tell if uh, that is at all useful for us. So we can break that down further and say we want 6L or lower, which would be 0 through, uh, uh, so that would be 60 through 64. Uh, 6 upper, which would be 65 through 69. 7 lower, which would be 70 through 74, 7 upper, which would be 75 through 79, and on down the line. When we do that, we get a better feel for the shape of the data. And again, this looks like it's kind of a normal distribution. Now, we can break that down even further as they've done here on the right-hand side, where we have the um, we have uh, 6z, that would be 60 and 61. 6t, that would be 62 and 63. 6f, which is 64 and 65, and 6s, which is um, 66 and 67, 6E would be 68 and 69, right? And then it starts over again with 7Z, 7T, 7F, 7S, and 7E. But you can see, in this case at least, it doesn't really give us a good shape of the data the way that the uh, the LU diagram did. Uh, but that's just in this case. Sometimes that might really help us 
to see what the data is doing. Um, all right, so here is our same um, our same data as it was done in Minitab. Uh, Minitab is one of many different um, uh, many uh, different statistical programs that can help you with data analysis. Um, uh, so there's Minitab, there's JMP, there is SSPS. Uh, as I said, there are many different kinds. Um, and for that matter, I have also taught students to use uh, Excel to create the same kind of things. All right, so here's the summary statistics for that same data from Minitab. All right, so next we need to think about histograms. Um, so a histogram gives us a summary of the data and in some ways it can be uh, more compact than a stem and leaf. Um, so we divide our data into ranges. Um, we call those sometimes class intervals, cells, or bins. We want them to be equal width so that we are looking at information um, uh, in an objective way. All right, so here's example 2.6 from the Engineering Statistics book. Um, I don't know if this is in your uh, book. So they, um, they strike golf balls uh, with a mechanical device um, and uh, then they measure the distances in yards uh, that the, each of those golf balls achieved, right? So 100 golf balls makes it, makes it easy because we know that our bins or class intervals or cells, whatever we want to call them, will be the square root of the number of uh, data points. So when we take the square root of 100, that's obviously 10. Um, so we go here, we see the actual data, um, which uh, they've measured uh, uh, pretty precisely, as you can see, going to one digit behind the uh, uh, behind the, uh, the decimal. All right, so we have our uh, data here. We have our ten bins, but one bin is totally empty. Or is that totally empty, or is that just one? I'm not quite sure. Um, but uh, essentially, a bin is five yards wide, right? So the 250 bin appears to be empty. The uh, 255 bin... Uh, uh, has a few, 260, a uh, bit more, 265, 270 has the uh, highest number, 275 has a few, 280 has a, has a little tiny bit more than 275, 285, 290, and 295. Right? Now, I would be tempted to go ahead and call this a normal, uh, a normal curve, um, even though it doesn't precisely fit uh, what we would think of as a normal uh, curve.
they did this again, dividing uh, up the bins even further uh, to 16 bins. And you'll notice that then the curve starts to look um, more like a double uh, curve. All right, one um, variation of the histogram <coughs> is the Pareto chart. Um, we often use this in quality or process improvement um, where we might have uh, different defects, failure modes, or whatever category is of interest to us. We put uh, the largest frequency all the way on the left, then the second largest, third largest, uh, all the way down to the lowest number of frequencies. <clears throat> all right, so here they have a Pareto chart for our aircraft accident data, right? So the number of uh, airplanes lost per million departures from an airport, the McDonnell Douglas 11 is way out in the lead with about six and a half uh, losses per million departures. Um, Next comes the 707-720 uh, with a slight bit less DC-8, uh, F-28, uh, BAC-111, uh, and all, on the way, all the way down to the 737-3, 4, and 5 with the lowest number. Um, now, you may be um, wondering what the hell some of these even are, since McDonnell Douglas may have been out of business uh, during your entire lifetime. Uh, uh, McDonnell Douglas was a, uh, an aircraft company that was absorbed by uh, Boeing. Uh, and, uh, well, I don't know what else to tell you about that. Um, now, if we were aircraft investigators and we wanted to know why aircraft were being lost, we would start with this data, the furthest on the left, and find out, do all those crash crashes have some similarity that could be addressed and could be um, improved so that we wouldn't have any more crashes uh, with an MD-11, right? Then we would look at, then we would look at the 707-720, find out what could be done for that, and on down the line. All right, so a box plot is a um, type of display that we've talked about and it can give us several features of our data uh, all at once. So it'll show us the center, what is the spread, uh, is there a symmetry or no symmetry, um, and how far away are the furthest observations. Right, so we have, uh, when we talk about those that are further away, we have the whiskers, we have outliers, and we have extreme outliers. The extreme outliers are the ones you see standing on the street corners shouting at passers-by. No, no, wait, sorry, I'm, uh, I was just kidding about that. Um, All right, so 
we have uh, a box plot here. Um, the whisker goes to the smallest data point within 1.5 interquartile ranges from the first quartile. All right, so that means the first quartile, as you may remember, means that all the data below that is 25% of the data. Um, the uh, second quartile is uh, the point where uh, that we call the median in some other uh, things. So in other words, the median, all the data to the left of the second quartile is 50% of the data. The third quartile means that 25% from the median to 75% of the data is represented by this part of the box plot. The whisker comes out to the largest data point within one and a half interquartile ranges uh, from the third quartile. And then you have outliers and an extreme outlier here. All right, so for our compressive strength data that we were looking at earlier, this is the box plot. So you'll notice we have some outliers here and I'm not sure whether we would call this furthest one an extreme outlier or not. Now, box plots are often used to compare the performance of, uh, of similar things in different locations or uh, maybe even in the same location. In this in this case, this is theoretically the con comparative box plots of a quality index at three different plants. Okay, uh, so it's obvious that plant two has the biggest um, uh, variation in its quality index. Oh, come back here. Um, which means that as an engineer, if I were looking at these three plants, I would say the place I've got to start is plant two, looking at why we have so much variation in our quality, right? Plant three obviously has the least uh, variation in its quality, and then plant one uh, is, the, uh, is the middle uh, for that. All right, so we've talked about um, uh, we've talked about stem and leaf diagrams, we've talked about histograms, and we've talked about um, uh, and we've talked about box plots. The other kind of plot that we should worry about, is what's called a time series or time sequence plot. Um, in this case, we are going to put down the data in the order it occurs. Um, so our uh, y-axis is the observed value of the variable. And the horizontal axis is our time in which uh, the, the variable was recorded. So what does that allow us to do? Well, it lets us see trends or cycles within the data uh, or other broad features of the data. I hate it when they put down something so ambiguous as that. All right, so here we have two time series plots of the same data. In this one, it is using 
it goes from 1982 to 1991 using the total yearly data. All right, so that shows uh, an upward twin, uh, trend, which of course you always want company sales to show. But what might be more revealing is to look at the data where we are looking at it by quarters. So we have the 1989 data here uh, for the first quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter. Now, the um, uh, so we can see the first two quarters tend to have the higher sales, and then third and fourth, no, nah, not so much, and that holds through true through the whole. Um, a diagram, right? So if we are looking at this to know how much to produce during any given time, then we're going to say, uh, look, uh, we should be pro uh, producing to meet first quarter demand we might say we want to start producing in the fourth quarter to meet that first quarter demand, depending on how long it takes to make something, right? But we can see we have to be ready to do most of our sales in the first two quarters. Uh, in this case, they did a, um, uh, a time series plot of the compressive strength data uh, that was used, um, uh, that's been used as an example through this chapter. Um, and uh, you can see, okay, they've got, uh, they've got that back and forth. Um, if we were looking at this as a, uh, a, uh, a quality control chart, we would also have lines of what are the boundaries that are acceptable in here. All right, so this is one on chemical process concentration readings. Um, and as you can see, they've gone for a much more limited stem and leaf diagram accompanying that um, because you want this to be inside very tight limits. All right, well, sometimes we are looking at data where we have uh, f where each time we record data, we are actually putting down several variables um, at once, right? The What we have done before is for univariate data. In other words, one observation of one variable is happening uh, for each uh, each time we observe. Uh, but again, sometimes we have multivariate data where we have to, um, uh, where we're looking at several things at once. Uh, usually we're doing that because we know or we suspect there are relationships between the variables and we want to build a uh, an empirical model. All right, so in this case, we have 25 observations and we have three different variables. There's the pull strength, the wire length, and the die height. Right, and you can see the the data is recorded 
for each of those three on those 25 observations. All right, when we look at that, we can then do it in a two-dimensional format uh, where, for example, here it's strength versus length, right? And they have a, um, a scatter diagram as well as a box plot uh, 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 for each of those. And then you have strength versus die height. Uh, and you can see here the data on this scatter diagram is even more scattered. And they also have the box plots uh, for each of those. Oh, well, apparently we're not going to show what that looks like when we start to make a surface out of it. Um, our correlation coefficient, um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, don't panic. Well, uh, I really want you to be familiar with the idea behind this rather than we are going to be calculating sample co correlation coefficients all over the place. All right, so we have pairs of data, um, uh, which they have recorded as Y1, X1, Y2, X2, all the way up to Yn, Xn. The sample correlation coefficient uh, is labeled as R, and we see how strong the relationship is between our, uh, our X's uh, and Y's uh, by doing this, um, right? Now you'll notice R goes from negative one, which is like there is absolutely no correlation at all, less than or equal to R, to less than or equal to plus one, which is these are absolutely correlated. Um, but we need to remember the old scientific saying, correlation is not causation. Um, all right, so... Uh, they show us here some multivariate data, the diagrams of um, the diagram here, R is near plus one, and it looks like that lines up pretty well. Um, B is R is near negative one, uh, so that pretty much is showing us uh, no um, um, uh, no uh, relationship. Here you notice the scatter diagram is just all over the place. So R is near zero. Y and X aren't related. And here um, uh, R is near zero. Y and X are non-linearly related. So you might be able to find some other uh, way of relating those in that case. All right, here's some more uh, multivariate data. It's data on shampoo. Um, and they have, in this case, they have six different uh, uh, variants that they're looking at. So the variables are foam, scent, color, residue, region, and quality. Uh, here they've done a, um, a, a diagram where they are 
measuring the correlations between these. Um, uh, so you'll notice that um, uh, foam, scent, color, residue, region are here, and scent, color, residue, region, and quality are here. Um, you'll notice foam is left off this one and quality is left off this one. And that is because, for example, here where scent lines up with scent, well, there's no point in calculating that. It's the same thing. Same with color and color, residue and residue, region and region. And we can look and see what is uh, well correlated. Foam and scent, for example, very poorly cor correlated, very close to zero. On the other hand, quality and foam are uh, are pretty well correlated at a 0 0.512 um, and color and scent are even better correlated at 0 0.599. Usually with the uh, correlation coefficient, anything above uh, 0 0.3 we consider as something that we should consider and look at. Um, all right, so, but you also see region and quality definitely not correlated. Pretty much the same with quality and residue, right? So we see examples of things that are well correlated and not so correlated here. Uh, so here they've done... Uh, uh, scatter plots for um, all of the uh, uh, all of the different uh, variables against each other. Um, oh, bloody hell! I uh, uh, I'm just going to say drink that in because I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, so they're looking at here the scatter diagram of the shampoo quality versus foam. And you'll notice they put an extra uh, piece of data in by saying it's either eastern region or western region by how they denote the um, how they denote the um, uh, the data points. Right? Now you remember that one is about a 0 0.512, the, um, uh, the correlation between quality and foam. And you can see it lines up somewhat. We've got some outliers that don't line up so well, uh, but that's the nature of uh, a partial correlation. Um, all right, so we see that um, uh, and here they separate out further on the basis of what is the residue. And they're saying if the residue is less than or equal to 4.6, it's over here. If the residue is over, uh, is greater than or equal to 4, it's over here. Um, now, how do they measure residue? God only knows. Uh, uh, all right. Well, that was a super fast look at um, at our um, uh, data display. Now, I hope that you notice there is one kind of display that they did not put in there, and that is the pie chart. Pie charts are not good representatives of what is uh, going on because they're so hard to interpret. 
uh, I don't really want to go through the um, uh, through the human factors thing there, but um, let me just say that you have trouble making judgments about uh, whether uh, how thick a slice of the pie is um, when they're close together. And very often you have a, a situation where there is there is so much data that there are way too many colors in your pie chart and human beings can only really distinguish uh, about seven or eight colors in a chart of that type. Um, all right. So um, to make sure that, ooh, ooh. well, damn it, I, uh, uh, I went, I uh, was clever enough to uh, um, uh, uh, I was clever enough to uh, oh that's slow uh, um to go through that in about half the time uh, for our class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and we'll go through some of the Chapter 6 Descriptive Statistics presentation. And, um, um, but uh, skipping a lot where uh, I feel like the material's been covered well. Um, now, both of these presentations will be uh, posted on Moodle for you along with this uh, video. Your homework, as I said before, will still be on Wiley Plus. Having said that, let's plunge boldly into... Uh, uh, chapter 6. Um, all right. Well, we already know data is numerical observations of our variable or phenomenon of interest. Um, of course, we always want to look at it in terms of uh, how we uh, uh, interpret that with graphical display very often. Uh, sample mean, we went through that. Uh, we went through uh, how to um, define uh, our sample variance and our population variance. Uh, standard deviation, again, is square root of the variance. Uh, and the symbol is just the same symbol uh, sigma or S, uh, but not squared. This shows an example of how we uh, how we build a uh, a little uh, chart to figure out our variance, our our mean, our variance, and uh, our standard deviation. Uh, ba, 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 bum. All right, we went through um, degrees of freedom is a kind of an important thing. We're going to get into that more as we get into uh, using uh, the uh, T distribution. That is another normal distribution but one where um, uh, the variance is unknown, right? So far, we've just worked with uh, distributions where variance is known. 
Um, our sample range is something that we want to keep in mind that uh, the range, uh, which is not in this case uh, the um, uh, sample correlation coefficient, uh, usually range is symbolized by capital R. I don't know why they use small r in this case. But it's just the maximum observation minus the minimum observation. Uh, stem and leaf diagrams, we already went through this. Um, we are quartiles. Uh, again, the first or the lowest quartile, 25% of the data is less than quartile one. Second quartile, 50% of the data is less than quartile two. In other words, it is the median. The third quartile, 75% uh, of the data is less, is less than quartile three. Oh, bloody hell. Um, Um, so, um, let's uh, uh, talk instead about uh, frequency distributions. A frequency distribution is a compact summary of our data. Uh, we put it in a table, a graph or some kind of a function. Uh, we often use a histogram with bins or cells uh, and called a uh, uh, class interval. Uh, all right, so uh, here they have put uh, again, the same compressive uh, concrete data into a um, into this table where they have defined the class intervals here, and um, and f calculated the relative frequency and the cumulative uh, relative frequency. Uh, all right, so we talked about our histograms before. Um, in this case, they have uh, followed the rule. The, uh, the compressive strength uh, was of 80. Oh, well, they're saying in this case, aluminum, lithium, alloys um, uh, 80 if you divide uh, if you do this uh, take the square root it's going to be a little tiny bit less than 9 so they've made 9 intervals um, and they show the data shows a pretty much normal curve Um, all right, histograms with unequal bin widths, I say that it becomes a bit of a problem uh, because it's wide open to misinterpretation. I would st stick to equal bin widths. Um, all right, here they've gone ahead and redone uh, that same uh, histogram, but you'll notice this just looks kind of like a mess. Um, uh, so, in fact, why did they even show us that? 
Here they're showing you the cumulative uh, frequency against the strength. Uh, sometimes this is useful, uh, sometimes, but usually we do it in conjunction with our regular histogram. Uh, uh, when we look at our histogram, we can look at and say, you know what, this shows a significant skew to the left of our uh, distribution. This would seem to show a more normal distribution, and this is a skew to the right. We really didn't go over the distributions um, uh, that uh, skew a lot, like the beta distribution, the log normal, uh, Erlang, etc. Um, but don't worry, I'm confident that Dr. Ro uh, Romani will go over these with you. All right, so when we're talking about um, categorical data, we have um, uh, we have some uh, two different kinds. There's ordinal, where there is some kind of order that underlies the data. Uh, the examples they give here are the year in college, military rank. Uh, nominal means that our categories are different, right? We have uh, categories based on gender, categories based on colors. Hopefully those aren't in the same uh, uh, histogram, uh, since that might uh, turn out to be a bit on the racist side, uh, right? But we might do um, uh, in our nominal, we might do a, uh, a histogram of males versus females um, in our college, and then have males versus females in general, males versus females in the science, studying in the science department, in the engineering, math, and technology, etc. Colors, we might just uh, sit by the uh, gate and record the color of everyone's shirt as they're coming in and make a histogram uh, based on that. Um, so they do mention a Pareto chart. Um, here's a Pareto chart of numbers produced uh, by Boeing in 1985. So they um, produced 737s uh, the most. Um, this is not surprising. Boeing has a uh, an assembly line uh, that can produce a 737 every day. And I understand that since then, They've actually duplicated that because the 737 is so popular. Uh, okay, so um, you'll notice they show us exactly the same diagram that we saw in the last presentation for our box plots. Um, here they're showing us that uh, compressive um, strength of the uh, aluminum lithium alloy specimens. Um, uh, time sequence plots, we went through this uh, in the last one. This is uh, by year. This is by uh, uh, the quarters within the years. And again, we see a trend here of upward sales. 
uh, you'll notice from 85 to 86, there's a dip. Well, that was a time when there was an economic downturn a little bit. And 88 to 89, uh, again, another one, right? But And this shows us our general, uh, and this shows us the seasonal trends. Uh, all right, we looked at this. Oh, bloody hell. Uh, now, constructing a probability plot is uh, kind of uh, a, an important idea. Uh, first of all, we're going to put the data observations in ascending order. All right, so from X1, X2, all the way up to Xn. Um, our um, observed value is going to be uh, plotted against the uh, cumulative frequency. And our paired numbers are plotted on probability paper of the proposed distribution. Uh, if our numbers form a straight line, then our hypothesized distribution adequately describes the data. Well, isn't that nice? Um, uh, but this does not really describe how to do this very well. Um, here we have an example in battery life. Um, you'll notice that our plot here, 100 times J minus um, uh, 0 0.5 divided by N um, uh, is uh, very um, uh, is actually a um, logarithmic scale right in other words our intervals uh, from 0 0.1 to 1 is going to be the same interval as from 1 to 10, be about there, right? Which, um, right, so, and then our, uh, our x-axis is just our observations. Um, Um, so there you go. Uh, J, as you'll notice, is the order in which we did uh, we rank the observations. Right? It's not that uh, X one here was one seventy six. It's that this is the lowest and we put them in order up to the highest. We can also do this based on our um, uh, standardized normal scores. And in this case, we don't have to use a logarithmic scale over here, um, we convert our J minus 0 0.5 divided by 10 to a Z score. And then it's just Z against X. Um, All right, so we look at this and we say, uh, when we do that, we look at it and we say, all right, is our, let me go back. 
See, you'll notice here when we use the probability plot with the standardized normal scores, look how close all the observations are to the line. When we come here, though, we say, hmm, boy, there's kind of a lot of variations away from the line on these. Um, and so uh, maybe these aren't as normal as we would like. You'll notice they say all of these are non-normal distribution. Now, when we use them, when we use a probability plot with the logarithmic scale, then we are going to uh, use what we call the fat pencil test. In other words, we have a line that we hypothesize or in this case, the computer has generated a, uh, a line that is uh, uh, done by regression, and that is the line that best fits the data. But then we have a, these two curved lines on the outside. As long as all uh, our data falls within these curved lines, we go ahead and call it. Uh, uh, we go ahead and call it a uh, normal distribution. Uh, all right, and there you go. All right, now we still have time. For that matter, I don't have to worry about you going to your next class. So I can take as much time as I want here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and um, let us go ahead and build a diagram like Um, uh, like the ones uh, that they're uh, using. All right, so X, J. Um, all right, and because it's going to fit very... Um, Uh, nicely uh, in our uh, in what I've got here let me uh, uh, go ahead and um, and uh, create a set of data randomly all right so we're going to do equals rand between. Uh, let's make the zero of uh, the bottom to be um, uh, zero point one, comma, and the top to be ten, just to keep things simple. Uh, all right, so I've got my uh, uh, my distribution there. I'm just going to pull that down and do 15 uh, observations. And I'm wondering, is it that? Okay, well. Um, they all came out to be uh, exactly uh, they all came out to be exactly um, um, 
integers uh, I wonder if I change that one thing to remember when you're using this is that uh, every time you fool with one of the cells it's going to change your your data um, hmm all right how about if I make this larger I know it's probably fascinating to you guys to watch me fooling around with this all right well damn it it's gonna just keep coming out as um, uh, as uh, integers and that's not really gonna matter for us uh, in the end oh wait what happened here all right here try pulling this down all right so I'm gonna go ahead and copy then I'm going to paste uh, but wait I need to paste as values there you go all right so you'll notice here now I have a nice little set of data um, but in fact I'm I'm already dissatisfied with this <laughs> but let's just go forward all right so here we go now I'm going to go to the data tab I'm going to sort the uh, smallest to largest All right, so here I've got uh, smallest to largest. Um, um, all right, so this is one, two, and then I'm just going to pull this down because I'm too lazy to type up to 15. All right, so this is equal uh, to our 1 minus our 0 0.5 divided by our 15, and I will put dollar sign dollar sign so that will stay the same and this will be equal to a hundred times um, our well bloody hell Uh, all right, so there you can see, uh, here we go, we've arranged that. Now, I'm going to uh, insert a, uh, let's do a line chart, uh, 3D line, no, no, no. Um, all right, chart title, um, yes, edit the text, uh, okay, Now, over here, I can, uh, okay, damn it, there we go. Uh, now that I uh, 
M over here, you'll notice I right clicked on one of the points and I'm going to come down here to Format Axis. And so, um, Uh, and I'm going to go to a logarithmic scale um, right so alright so I've got that access formatted now let us choose the data Um, and it's series one, um, uh, right. Hmm. Mm. Mm. Well, I'm really wishing I had had, uh, uh, time to, um, uh, uh, to practice. Um, uh, doing this. I guess I did have time. I just, uh, um, uh, it didn't occur to me to do it. Oh, wait, that's not the sheet name. Let's make this that. Okay. And then we're going to say equal... that and and our horizontal category edit equals there all right Okay, well, um, troopers, I'm going to post a separate video on uh, on doing this. Uh, I personally, I never use the uh, uh, the uh, J minus uh, zero point five, uh, so I will post another video of me doing that. Uh, doing it that way and doing it with the uh, with the Z distribution. Uh, so I am going to sign off here, uh, and I'm going to do that in a minute. But first, I have to um, uh, first I have to uh, uh, figure out how to post this. And how to do your Wiley Plus uh, homework. Uh, anyway, look, keep social distancing, stay safe. I'll talk to you soon.